This week on the Computer Chronicles, Windows XP. We'll show you the new XP Home Edition and give you some advice on whether or not it's worth the upgrade. We'll roll out Windows XP Professional Edition and tell you what you get for the extra money. We'll take you to the lavish Windows XP launch party with Sting, Madonna, and Rudolph Giuliani. There's also a brand new version of Internet Explorer, release 6. We'll go through the new features for you. And not to be forgotten, Apple has a new version of its updated operating system for the Mac, OS 10.1. We'll show you what it can do. Plus, my pick of the week, the pros and cons of the Xbox. Windows XP, IE6, and OS 10. All coming up next on the Computer Chronicles. Computer Chronicles is brought to you by the Oracle Small Business Suite, one completely integrated application that helps make it easier to run your business, including accounting, sales and service, your web presence, and more. Additional funding is provided by PC to PC, the online migration service from PC First, moving files, applications, and preferences from your old computer to your new one. And welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Chaffe. Well, Microsoft is at it again with yet another new release of its Windows operating system in two versions, Windows XP Home and Windows XP Professional. And the question most Windows users are asking is, is it worth the money to upgrade? And that's the question we hope to answer for you this week. Here to start us out with a look at Windows XP Home Edition is Denny Arar, Senior Editor with PC World Magazine. And this is the magazine right here. Uh, in fact, this was your cover story on Windows XP. Should you upgrade? That's the question we're trying to get at. Let's start with some of the basics at home. First of all, slightly different graphics look on XP, right? Right. Um, if you hit the Start panel, you'll notice right away, look, it has my Little name on here. it. Okay. And it has, it's a square thing. It has a bunch of applications. These ones down here, they come in automatically. They reflect my usage. As I use an application frequently, it, it automatically so You might want to point here. with the cursor if you can so the audience can keep track of what okay. you're doing. Yeah. And then um, the ones on top here are ones that are fixed. They're always here. Right. And then you've got these other things. It's just more things Usual. to get to. Right. Now, I see you have Windows Messenger uh, down there in your taskbar. That's included now in the operating system, right? right? This is an instant messaging client, a la AOL Instant okay. Messaging or ICQ. And it allows you, as you can with these uh, other ones, to talk. It also has a, the ability, if you have webcams, mm -hmm. to look at somebody else online over webcam. Okay, so instant messaging with video, et cetera. Right, and to chat, even you can do a voice call, too, sure. as well. Yeah. So, and another thing it lets you do, which is really neat uh, for somebody who maybe uh, works with, you know, if your mother or somebody like that is far away and needs help mm -hmm. on the computer, it has the ability through this to initiate a request for help. So Ask this for is remote, remote assistance. assistance. Yeah, and what that does is, I mean, it, you know, it w if you follow through with it, it does take a little while to set yeah. up. So if your mom was having trouble with some problem on her computer, she had XP, you had XP, you both have Messenger, both you could take control of her computer from right. the other side Once of the country. Once this is all set up, you can actually see the computer being manipulated by the person at the other end, and it, you know, it can be really helpful. Yeah. Once again, this is a feature you could have gotten before from a third party, but now a lot of this is bundled inside the operating That's system. That's correct. That's correct. All right. Now you showed before that when you went to, when you opened the Start Panel, it said Denny. Right. That, well, let's talk about that. The fact is, you can have separate user profiles running at the same time. Right. This now. is very new for uh, Windows. Um, what this is for is a, a home or a business where you've got several people using the mm -hmm. same computer. And what this allows you to do is create profiles for each one to customize the computer to what they like. I have another person set up on here, switch mm -hmm. user. And this is what you get when you boot up. And Christian, that's my husband, okay. um, you know, I would type his password in. And there are his settings, his wallpaper. Wall you know, now, and does it keep both applications running? Do you have to kill everything? Right. For now, him to I start remember on? I had it Windows Messenger running right. there. Um, if I go back to me, back to switch user again. No, no, I want it back. Okay. See, it said I had one program running. Okay. So this is really useful. Yeah, again. so we're going to have several multiple accounts all sort of going at the same time. Right, and, and also you can limit if you're, a, you know, say I use this for my business, I don't want my kids messing around got with it. it. Got it. I can give them limited access to various uh, And again, another user can pop computer. in, do something, get out, and you can go back to where your work That's was right. before. That's right. That's right. Very nice feature. 
All right, what other things can we talk about? I guess one of the best features of XP is something you can't really show, and that is that it, it sort of works, right? Right, it's a much more stable operating system. If you've been using Windows 95 or 98 yeah. um, or Millennium, you know, it really does, it, it crashes less. Yeah. That's a yeah, very yeah, good yeah, reason yeah, to get an yeah. operating system, especially, I, I think it bears mentioning that even though this is called Home Edition, this does not mean that it's not appropriate for yeah, a lot of small and medium businesses, yeah. because the features that, that it lacks, that are in professional are really IT, you know, staff oriented, right, and, right. and many small businesses do their own uh, IT work. Sure. So, bottom line, worth upgrading if you're a 98 user or an ME user? I would, I would definitely take a look at this. There are very few people. Yeah. The only stumbling block would be lack of support for your devices. You will want to check with your vendors of your yeah. scanners, of your printers. You know, to make sure that there's an XP driver, Got and they're, they don't all offer them, yeah, so that can yeah. be an issue. Right, we're going to talk about that in a minute. Thanks so much, Denny. Welcome. All right, well, for a little bit more money, you can upgrade to Windows XP Professional Edition, a little bit more geared to the network or office environment. And here to help us evaluate XP Pro is Rob Enderly, who is Research Fellow and Vice President of the Gig Information Group. Well, you saw a little bit about uh, what we did there with Denny on Home. The fact is Home and Professional are very much alike, aren't they? Well, pretty much identical under the covers. They use the same kernel. In fact, it was Microsoft striving to this single kernel, the single architecture to reduce costs, reduce support, not only for them, but for third-party software developers and device manufacturers who were having problems trying to integrate right. with Windows NT, 2000, 98, ME, sure, became a nightmare. Sure. So it makes it easier for them. So XP Home and Pro are really Windows 2000.1 or something? Yeah, Windows 2000.1 <laughs> is a good way to look at it. It allows somebody to go from work, go to home, and kind of have the same kind of experience. Okay. So just briefly describe, what is the difference in professional? What do you get? How is it better if you're in a more heavy-duty network environment where you care about that issue or security? Well, if you're in a large corporation, typically you, you plug into a domain. You might have Microsoft's Active Directory in the background. Right. So a person can log in and they can kind of get access to all the printers, all the storage facilities, and everything else located across a very robust and geographically dispersed mm -hmm. enterprise. It's got that capability. Where somebody at home, you got a printer right, here, right, you got a couple right, of machines right. maybe in the Good house. Deal. You don't need all that stuff, and you, and you really don't want to have to administer thousands right. of machines anyway. All right, let's talk about some of the features which might be more uh, of interest to the, the professional user, even though a lot of these are also in home. One is the transfer wizard, which makes it easier to migrate from one machine to another, which again was an old third party idea, but now is in the operating system. Yeah, folks like Altiris and Miramar mm -hmm. did products in the space, but we looked at customers last year, and for instance, the number one reason that most of them were not buying new machines was because it was costing the them <laughs> to move to them, and users were saying, wait a minute, it's working, leave me alone. Right. So what this does is it provides an easy way for you to pull all the stuff from a user from their old machine and then go ahead and put it onto a new machine. For instance, on this menu, you just identify whether this mm -hmm. is the new or old machine, the machine that's getting the stuff or giving the stuff. It creates a big file. You transfer it to the new machine in a, in a matter of an hour or so. You can go grab a cup of coffee. Yeah. You can come back and, and, uh, and you can have new that. New machine looks like the old machine. New machine looks identical to the old okay. machine. Another nice feature, a lot of people are into the Wi-Fi 802.11b world right now. And this has a nice feature there in terms of wireless networks. Go through that, Rob. Well, it's where they really did an awful lot of the improvement in terms of the networking. It, it allows you to go through and discover wireless networks. Up to now, you had to kind of figure out what the, the system mm -hmm. ID was for these access points. And they might be written on the bottom, which is a real okay. problem if they're up in the ceiling. Okay. Um, or they might be someplace else. This actually discovers them, so you get the, uh, the system IDs on here, you double click on it. If it's not encrypted, you're on almost immediately. So you just wander around, it'll tell you what wireless networks are around there. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, we talked a little bit uh, about this with, with Denny, but uh, system restore, things like driver issues, show how XP works better there. Well, this actually takes its, its core from Windows ME, which is a, was an incredibly unreliable product yeah. and kind of lived on system restore. It was <laughs> down so much that you used that to restore yourself back to a point when it was actually working. This has that, and from the standpoint of an administrator that is administering thousands of machines, having a user be able to go back and fix problems they created, realize that about 80% of the problems that's yeah, helped yeah. us deal with, the user created them themselves, it brings up an easy screen to say, okay, to restore it to an earlier point. Does it automatically find earlier points, or do you have to set those? Absolutely. It goes back okay. and whatever. Anytime you install a major piece of hardware, it actually sets a point, and you can go back to that particular point and, and when Got it was it. working, and you're back in, and you're up and restored. Okay. Another version of that, or a piece of that, I guess, is driver restore. Another problem, you install a new driver, and you've screwed things up, and you want to go back to where you were just with regard to a device driver. Yeah, I've had this experience myself. I put it into a video card, and somehow I've lost a set of features. For instance, right. I like to use twin monitors. Almost every time I put it in a new card, yeah. only one <laughs> monitor comes right. up when yeah. I'm done. So I just take it back to the earlier driver. Suddenly, I've got both monitors up. I'm not spending the time online or with the help desk. Got I fixed it. myself. Useful. 
Uh, dynamic updating, that's a nice feature too, right? Yeah, absolutely. What does it do? Uh, what it does is allows it to go back to the Windows Update site and, and pull down uh, driver updates, uh, patches to the operating system, and it loads them behind the scenes. And so uh, instead of having to go up and download from the Windows Update site, which is what you've had to do before and yeah. do it live, kind of wait for it to download and then do stuff, it's all waiting for you on your machine. You click, click go, gotcha. it installs it, you're off and running. All right, summarize now pros and cons of XP Professional. Well, the big pros are it's much better on a network. It's a point one product. Corporations like point one products instead of a point right. zero product. And it's a huge jump in terms of security and reliability from the 9X mm -hmm. base. Uh, disadvantages are they could still have gone farther with regard to network discovery. A lot of folks, I mean, we talked about the wireless stuff, but yeah. realize a lot of folks are going from the corporation, they're going home. Uh, they've got to change network settings and the rest of it. It is not seamless at all. Some got might be it. dynamic, some might be fixed okay. IP addresses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Still yeah. A, a very big mess. So it's one of the improvements they clearly could make. All right, bottom line question again, is it worth the upgrade? For most folks, it probably is, because most folks are on a 9X product. If they've already done a migration to Windows 2000 and they're stable, they might want to wait okay. for the next version, Longhorn, which is going to be out a little but bit over a year. using 95, 98? 95, 98, it's an easy decision. Do it. Yeah. All right, thanks very much. Well, when Microsoft launches a new product like Windows XP, it usually does it in a big way. This time they featured Madonna, Sting, New York Mayor Rudolph Giuliani, and of course, Bill Gates. This is a milestone for PC users. People spend a lot of time in front of their PCs. We have over 400 million users who sit down and use Windows every single day. Gates chose New York for the U.S. launch of Windows XP, but that was just one part of a simultaneous worldwide launch, including major events in Seattle, London, England, Sao Paulo, Brazil, Cape Town, South Africa, and Sydney, Australia. But the New York launch was clearly the center of the XP universe. Mayor Rudolph Giuliani took part in the official launch thanking Bill Gates for bringing the event to the Big Apple. I wish you the very best of luck with it, and I thank you and all of the other business leaders that are here uh, for this launch of this new product, which, uh, which really couldn't come at a better time uh, for the city of New York. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. And Microsoft customers in New York were rewarded with autographed copies of XP, and Gates and company visited a Manhattan Comp USA as part of the day-long launch celebration. It's fun to see people here tonight. And just to make sure everyone paid attention to the Windows XP launch, Microsoft got Madonna to provide the music for the new XP TV commercial. And the launch day concluded with a live webcast of a concert in New York's Bryant Park, as Bill Gates played host to rock star Sting. Ladies and gentlemen, Sting. I don't drink coffee, I drink my beer. I like my toast on one side. But you can hear it in my accent when I talk. I'm an English man in New York. Microsoft has not only upgraded its operating system with the launch of Windows XP, it has also come out with a new upgrade to its web browser, Internet Explorer version 6. And here to tell us about the changes in IE is Mike Elgin, former editor of Windows Magazine, now editorial director for Interex. Mike, uh, let's talk about some of the things that are new in IE. A lot of people don't even know that it, there's, a, there's a 6 out there with lots of different things in it. And then one of the things you like is this picture resizer or whatever. Explain what that does. Well, what this is, you're looking at here at a picture, uh, standard p JPEG in, a, in the browser window, and it looks uh, pretty normal. Now, you'll notice if I reduce the size of this picture, the picture reduces as well, automatically. It's mm -hmm. called picture resizing. Right. It's a very nice feature. And in fact, when I click on this picture, I get a button down here that when I click on it, it gives me the real size of this picture, which, which is a humongo picture. It's yeah. huge. Now, yeah. this is what the old version of Internet Explorer would show right, you. Right, exactly. Click again, and then click on the button, and I'm down here. Mm -hmm. So that's a really nice feature. Okay. 
Uh, okay, what else can we talk about? There's the media bar, which is kind of a cool way to interface with, with media stuff. That's right, and this is probably the biggest new feature in Internet Explorer 6. Now, by clicking on this button, you can toggle between media bar and no media bar, mm -hmm. and what this allows you to do is listen to music. Is everything's still videos. going over here on your browser and whatever That's site right. you're working on. You can go anywhere you want, and there's a universal sort of CD player down here, and you can listen to music and okay. watch movies and so on. Pretty neat feature. All right, media bar. Now, another thing that's nice, sort of relates to that picture resizer in a way, is the ability to print selectively with through, through right. a better print preview. That's right. One of the big demands from some earlier versions was the ability to print preview. And of course, they put that into a previous version right. of Internet Explorer. Now they've really done something great. Now, I've got a, a, a page here with frames. I'm going to click on print preview. And you'll notice an option in the print preview button here. It lets me look at the page as it looks right. uh, in real and life. A lot of times you don't want to print the page as it looks. That's right, because oftentimes they're well, advertising there, and yeah. so on. So I'm going to select one of the options, which is all frames individually, and then I'll reduce the size here. And I can see uh -huh. each of the frames individually and print them individually. Ah, cool. Okay. Yeah, that's a nice feature. All right, so uh, now another thing, let's talk about related links, which is a nice thing that's built into IE6. Okay, well here we've got the Computer Chronicles site, and we've got related links on this side. now. Where's it getting that from? It's getting that from Alexa, uh -huh. uh, which is a search engine. Right. It's very intelligent. It actually works very nicely. Not too bad. Netcafe was the first thing it came up with. That was pretty smart. That's right. Okay. Now, as you, uh, one problem with it is that as you go across the Internet, these links stay there until you select okay. the option again. They don't okay. shift with the pages that you look at. All right. Uh, another nice feature that's built in is improved privacy controls, right? Particular cookies and stuff like that. Show us what it does. Okay. Well, I'm bringing up the Scientific America site, and I'm going to demonstrate this before I tell okay. you what it does. Now, as I bring up this site, I'm getting cookies both from Scientific America and also from their advertisers. And yeah. I've selected to, to be prompted for the advertisers' cookies and just give me the Scientific America. So cookies. you can choose one cookie but reject the third party third cookies. Third party cookies okay. are, are rejected. So I'm going to block each of these individually. Then the site will come up. I think there's probably another cookie on here from a third party. There it is, two mm. more. And now I've got the site. It, no cookies other than the one from Scientific okay. America. Because the problem is a lot of advertisers, you don't know who those are going to be. Exactly. And uh, another great feature related to that, if I may, is down here you'll notice a, uh, a little icon. The little lower right hand corner we're That's looking right, at right the now. privacy report. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to double click on that and uh -huh. I get this and I'll double click on one of these and I get all the information that Internet Explorer knows about. What's been going on under the hood That's about right. it tells you what it did in to, to protect your privacy yeah. because a lot of advertisers will drop the cookie even if you tell them not to. Yeah. All right, so a uh, couple of nice features here. I think we covered uh, uh, just a few of them, but some of the key ones. Uh, it's kind of an easy decision on an upgrade, isn't it? Absolutely. It's free. It's free of charge. If you're already using an old version of Internet Explorer, this is better. Yeah. And if you're using XP or XP Pro, you've already got this. Built in. So yeah. go in there and, and yeah. find some of these new features. Final question. There's still a lot of Netscape fans out there. And, in fact, Netscape has been ahead of the curve a little bit with some of these features. How would you compare the new Netscape versus IE6? Generally speaking, I think IE6 is a little ahead. Uh -huh. I've always been a big fan of having both. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't do any sure. harm yeah. to sure. you. But if you're a Netscape fan, stick with Netscape. This doesn't push it far enough ahead gotcha. for you to lose that preference. Right. Thanks so much, Mike. All right, well, there is another platform out there which many people love, including our director and producer, by the way. It's called the Macintosh. And Apple has recently released the latest version of its new operating system for the Mac, OS 10.1. Here to show us its new features is Ken Bereskin of Apple. How are you doing, Ken? Doing great, Stuart. And uh, there is some lovely stuff inside uh, OS 10 here. So let's start out basically with the user interface, which I guess you guys call Aqua, right? Um, absolutely. You know, after a, a very simple 15 or 20 minute upgrade, you can transform your Mac. And the first thing you see is the Aqua UI. Okay. Um, let's take a look at a, a couple simple things. I'll just open up an image. And one of the goals with Aqua is to just be as clean and as simple as possible. So yeah. here I have a window. You notice we're not using a lot of pixels to separate the window. Mm -hmm. um, we're really in crisp. instead yeah. using a, a beautifully uh, cast drop shadow mm -hmm. that gives it depth and dimension. Got it. Uh, if you resize the image, then the scroll bars appear so that you can manipulate yep. the image. Yep. But if it you don't need it, Got they it. all disappear. Okay. Now, you Aqua. Go ahead. Yeah, Aqua also uses uh, transparency a lot. Um, for example, if I pull down a menu, oh, you, can see through it. you can actually see the content That's of your great. document coming through. All the text is really finely anti-aliased to give you a very yeah. sharp, very readable UI as well. Nice. All right, so let's talk about the dock at the bottom and what you're doing there. Sure. So the dock is an important fixture of the Aqua user interface. It's the place that people go to access their most frequently used applications mm -hmm. and documents and folders. Um, so it's just one click to open up any of these applications. But it also has another great feature. 
If I click on our little minimize control right. featured in any window, um, it will uh, minimize directly down onto the dock. At the same a time. beautiful little animation that we call the Genie Effect. And right. of course, all you need to do is um, click, and it zooms back up. We have yeah. a we have a slow mo, so we can show You're you really into this stuff. exactly how the algorithm works. Right, and it really right. gives a great association. Right. Now, obviously, one of the cool things about the Mac and about OS X is its ability to handle digital applications. So let's take a look at some of those. iTunes is a hot one, obviously, and just show us a little bit how you do that in OS X. Oh, absolutely. People have you know a huge music collection and digital camcorders and digital cameras, and the Mac really right. is the the center of that digital hub. Um, an application like iTunes is really simple for managing and organizing your entire MP3 collection. Mm -hmm. So here's you know, all my CDs that I've ripped into the MP3 format. You can scan through artists, yeah, different albums, uh, and you can play it, Got obviously, it. directly on, so your, sure. on your Mac. Now, you have your iPod here, so let's show everybody the iPod. I do. Um, Turn it on, hold up so we can all see it. And just using the, the FireWire connection that's built right in, you can uh -huh. connect it up to your Mac. In and, and out of your Mac In less than 10 iPod. minutes, a 1,000 songs from your wow. music collection download automatically onto yeah, your iMac, yeah. so you have a 1,000 songs in your pocket. All right, show us real briefly iMovie, because obviously another really cool thing you can do in OS X. Uh, of course, if you've got a digital camcorder, uh, iMovie makes it really simple to grab the images, download into the computer, break them into clips, organize them into um, you know, different segments, mm -hmm. and we'll just play um, um, a resulting output. So here's a very simple you know, kid's shot with simple transitions, and this is perfect DV quality. You're not Looks losing any resolution. So dump your DV camcorder into the into right. the and go. So when you're finished, you can just gotcha. output it back to the DV camera or VHS, yeah. or if you have a Mac with a super drive, you can actually write that out to a DVD right, right. and make it work on right. any consumer DVD player. Let's talk about digital photography. You got your digital camera. I think you have a Kodak yep. or something over We've here. Got a, a mid-range Kodak consumer digital okay. camera. And all I need to do is turn this on. And Mac OS X is going to detect it automatically. We have drivers for all the popular USB mm -hmm. cameras. The yeah, image capture bounce, application the starts up. There's a number of options, but most people just choose to download the images uh -huh. automatically. And we're now transferring over fast USB from the camera into my Mac. Mm -hmm. And it's building rich preview icons so that you can actually see your images yeah, uh, before nice. you open them. And it will open up the folder in the Finder show you all those images automatically. And we've built in some great things as well. So you can like wallpaper these things or you whatever. You can make it your desktop. And mm -hmm. I, we also have a really great screen saver that's going to take all of these images out of your pictures folder huh. and build this really beautiful nice, presentation nice, that's nice, using nice. Hollywood effects. Yeah. All right, only a little bit of time left. And I know there's so much to cover. First of all, uh, the digital stuff is cool. A lot of people just want to work. Right. And there is Office for the Mac. And just show us briefly what that looks like. Sure. Microsoft recently introduced Office version 10. Um, they've really taken full maximum power of Mac OS X. Let me just open up a spreadsheet using Excel here. And you'll notice that the same graphic hues and tunes mm -hmm. from um, the Aqua user interface are there. But it's been tweaked for, for the Mac OS? It certainly has. Um, for example, if I edit a cell, you'll notice how the, the cell literally pops out of the screen. If I take a look at um, pie charts, um, yeah. beautiful use of graphics, so that it's very finely anti-aliased, great quality. Mm -hmm. And if I go into a 3D chart, um, one of the challenges with 3D series charts is that one series can block the other. So let's just uh, bring up our fill effects here. Use that transparency feature. And we're going to take advantage of that exact same transparency. We'll just set it to about 25 or 30 percent. Press OK, and now nice, you can nice, see the nice, entire nice. chart. All right, real quick, we're almost out of time. Show me the iBook and one cool thing you can do on the iBook. With Absolutely, OS we we take a lot of pride in the fact that we've designed the entire thing for consumers, from the hardware to the operating system, then with the key applications. Yeah. and you can really see that on something like an iBook. So or open a it up and, and notice that I open it up and within go to a work. second, <laughs> it's instant on, That's great. the user interface is there, your uh, wireless networking is all configured and you're ready to go. Ken, thanks so much. It's my pleasure, Stuart. All right, that's our look at the new generation of operating system software, but don't go away. I'll be back in just a moment with my pick of the week, Microsoft's new hardware product, the Xbox. Now for my pick of the week. So far, we've seen what's new for Microsoft in software, but these days, Microsoft is also a hardware company. And its new baby is the Xbox, a powerful computer disguised as a game console. As a dedicated gaming platform, the early reviews from gamers are mixed at best. But remember, you can only judge a game console by the games, and I think in the rush to get the Xbox out before Christmas, 
probably not enough attention was paid to developing the new games that would really make it shine. So the Xbox is not immediately apparently superior to the PS2 or the GameCube, but it has the potential to be. Just look at the specs. A 733 megahertz Pentium 3, a 250 megahertz custom graphics chip, 64 megs of RAM, an 8 gig hard drive for saving games, plus it comes with a 10100 Ethernet port, and it can handle 256 separate audio channels with full six-channel 3D audio in Dolby Digital. This is a pretty hefty computer. The first slate of games for the Xbox are cool. They look and sound great. Probably not enough to justify switching platforms, at least not yet. Now, one nice feature I do like about the Xbox actually is the newly designed game controller. It has a real solid feel to it, and it gives you lots of options for how to configure it. Now, the future of the Xbox clearly seems to be as a high-power broadband terminal. Online games and MSN bundle and Windows Messenger are no doubt somewhere in the pipeline, along with an optional keyboard. One of the coolest things, by the way, about the Xbox, given its fantastic sound capabilities, is the built-in audio CD player, which lets you dump CD tracks onto the hard drive and then build your own playlist, which you can then substitute as the music track for most games. The Xbox is selling for $299, but for some odd reason, you have to buy an extra add-on kit to enable it to play DVD movies, even though the game discs themselves are in DVD format. Well, that's it for this week's Computer Chronicles. If you need more information on anything you saw on this week's program, please check out our website at computerchronicles.org. Hope we'll see you here again next week. Computer Chronicles is brought to you by the Oracle Small Business Suite, one completely integrated application that helps make it easier to run your business, including accounting, sales and service, your web presence, and more. Additional funding is provided by pc to pc the online migration service from PC First, moving files, applications, and preferences from your old computer to your new one.